The following podcast is a deep, shallow dive production. And you're going to love it. Okay, let's go. Hey, what's up, everybody? Hope you guys had a good weekend. Yeah, something's kind of going on with my voice. Doesn't feel as doesn't feel as strong as it normally does. So bear with me on this episode. Anyway, wow, we are we are getting into the home stretch. So what I wanted to do today, and by the way, I am sorry about the Bernie Sanders episode not coming out on Friday. To be honest with you, I that whole thing was like an hour and twenty eight minutes, and then. With my commentary, it was, God, it almost came out to like two hours. And I realized that's like just too long. So I want to go through it and basically cut out a bunch of the fluff. I realized anybody that really wants to to watch that entire documentary, which again, I really do recommend. It's called Bernie's Blackout. You can find the full copy again on YouTube or on Tubi. T-U-B-I, Tubi, which is one of these like free services. And again, it, it's totally free. I really do recommend watching it. I think it's excellent. But like I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through it. I'm going to cut out the fluff. I thought that was just too much. I didn't think you guys needed to listen to the whole thing. So anyway, that, that, that'll that definitely arrive this week at some point. So we got the election coming here soon. I mean, it's really winding down. And so I wanted to give a a few thoughts on kind of what I see potentially happening. And then from there, I just want to play some clips for you guys that I think are interesting. So I actually get a lot of good feedback on that. I have people say, Hey, I love hearing the random clips. Sometimes they don't even really mesh together, but you know, there are things that I think are worth listening to. So anyway, as far as the election goes, you know, some some funny stuff over the weekend. I don't know if you saw, but Trump kind of did like a PR stunt where he went and worked in a McDonald's drive-thru. Now, I don't know. I don't know. I, to be honest, I thought it was goofy. I'm not going to lie. I, I, I think their goal was to say, Hey, look, you know, we're Trump is a man of the people, but to be honest with you, I think he already has that. He already has that vibe. I mean, he is kind of a man of the people or that's that's how he's been perceived. I mean, that's really what that entire MAGA movement is. So anyway, I'm not saying it was bad. I mean, I think it also does show a a funny side of him, but I can't say I thought it was amazing or anything along those lines. He did go on a few a few podcasts last week as well. And You know, I listened to him and the the main one he went on was the Patrick Bet David podcast, the PBD podcast. I've talked about that several times on this show. It's it's a really big podcast. I mean, he is up there now with I don't think it's as big as Joe Rogan or Tucker Carlson, but it's definitely in, let's say, the top ten podcasts. And I listened to it and you know, it wasn't it wasn't great. I mean, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't great. I will say, you know, I do think Trump is tired and I don't blame the guy. I really don't blame the guy. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I mean, whether you love him or you hate him, the dude is just a beast when it comes to what he does at his age and, you know, all the fire he's under, he just is. And if you hate him, that's fine. But man, you got to respect his grind. You really do. And I will say on the PBD episode, he just came off tired. And yeah, I I, I actually kind of felt bad for him. And that's really one of the first times, you know, I've really seen what I felt like. I was like, wow, he he sounds and looks really tired. Anyway. Kamala also has been on a few podcasts and namely she went on this podcast called Call Her Daddy. It's by this girl, Alex Cooper. It's ridiculously popular as well. I have no idea why. I, I've listened to several episodes and I don't know. I just, it, it's one of those, you know, life discussion podcasts, but I guess it's meant for for 30 year old women. And since I'm not a 30 year old woman, maybe I can't relate, but 
I don't really think that girl is that good. I really don't. And the episode with Kamala, you know, I thought that was very strategic by putting her on this call her daddy. They're really trying to appeal to that, you know, I'd say gen later gen X, gen Y, you know, demographic and they're really trying to firm up their their women women's voter base. So anyway, she was on Call Her Daddy. Trump was on PBD. Uh, Kamala also went on Charlemagne the God's Breakfast Club podcast. Again, I didn't think it was that great. I don't think I don't think either one of them has really done very well on the podcast circuit. I mean, it's obviously a circuit that that absolutely is is great to go on, but I can't say either one of those episodes, you know, really were any good, in my opinion. Trump also went on, this was a while back, he went on the comedian Theo Vaughn's podcast. Again, that one, I didn't think that one was great. I, I will tell you this, with all of these hosts that that I've seen, especially for Trump, not so much for Kamala, but no, it, it applies to her as well. You know, the problem with these podcast hosts is, and again, who knows, maybe I'd be the same way. I don't think I would, though. The problem is they just come off as fanboys and fangirls, and they're a little too, like, ass-kissy during the podcast versus treating them not like a normal person, but treating them like somebody that we want real answers from. You know, Patrick Bet David PBD, I'll give him credit. He he did the best job of not coming off super fanboyish, but the rest of these guys come off very fanboyish. All right, let me give you my thoughts on what's going on. The oh god, I didn't this is funny. I didn't even talk about this last week, but you know, they killed that Yaya Sinwar guy. Remember I've talked about that guy. God, I've probably mentioned his name a bunch of times during the past 50 episodes, but he was the de facto leader of Hamas. He was the one that I said, I think will be getting more attention and they'll make him into an Osama bin Laden figure. Anyway, they finally killed him. And here's what I'm going to say about all of it. It just, this entire thing, I'm going to, I finally came to a realization over the weekend, and that is. I think that this war in Gaza, Palestine, Israel, whatever you want to call it, I think this is going to cause some more disruption, potentially some type of disruption with the actual election on November 5th. And for lack of a better way of saying it or putting it, I think that what is going on between Israel Hamas, Hezbollah, Gaza, Palestine, and now Iran, I think collectively that region and that situation is equivalent to the the disruption that COVID caused in 2020. So for lack of a better way of putting it, that stuff going on over there is to 2024 as COVID was to 2020, meaning it's going to cause some continued disruption. It's going to cause some disruption in the night of the election. I wouldn't be surprised if they don't declare a winner on November 5th, the night where they normally around like 1130 at night, they'll, they'll, you know, declare whomever the winner. I wouldn't be surprised if for the first time ever that didn't happen because of quote unquote something. and. Yeah, it just it just doesn't make sense to me. Like they've wiped out the entire leadership of Hamas, the entire leadership of Hezbollah, and I don't I don't buy into this stuff when they say, "Oh, it's a move, it it's an ideology." Dude, ideologies don't fight one of the most sophisticated armies of the world, meaning I don't know, the stuff all just seems like it's it seems like a charade and the end goal of this charade is again chaos disruption and again f- forever wars military industrial complex you know funding of having an enemy having a boogeyman having somebody we have to go up against i i really do believe that i i genuinely do and cuz i i right now i'm just like 
how does Hamas or Hezbollah or any of these guys, how are they even remotely competing against, you know, the Israeli army is insane. I mean, their technology is insane. They're, you know, they're, they're backed by the United States, England, France, all three of those countries. So like, it's just not a fair fight. And I don't understand how it even is a fight. And I will tell you, it's, it's getting interesting. There's a lot of people like random, normal people that say incredibly astute things on the internet. Let me give you an example. Give, this is like a random white lady that I saw on Instagram. Listen to what she says. And real quick, when she says H group, she's referring to Hamas. Are you guys as confused as I am? Because I was told all the leaders of the H group are billionaires living in Qatar. And I was also told that the H group hides among the civilian population and uses them as human shields. And that's why they've had to blow up every single hospital, school, university, mosque, bakery in Gaza. Really quick, because again, I think this was incredibly astute. So remember... 10 months ago, nine months ago, eight months ago, seven months ago, you know, it's all been said that, oh, these leaders of Hamas are billionaires living in hotels in Qatar, right? That was the big thing. They're living in hotels in Qatar, Qatar actually, and they're billionaires, blah, blah, blah. Well, if you saw the footage of Yaya Sinwar being killed, not only was he not in a hotel in Qatar, he was in a random, like random building by himself, by the way, there was nobody else around him. So why is the leader, the, literally the billionaire leader, first of all, why are you by yourself? Why do you not have an entourage? Secondly, why are you above ground? I thought you lived in tunnels. I thought you were completely like insulated through this tunnel network. Instead, when he got killed, this, you know, quote unquote drone footage from the IDF showed him like on the second floor of this building. Right. And he had a stick. He was like throwing a stick at this drone. So, so why are you by yourself? Why are you above ground? Why aren't you in, you know, the tunnels where supposedly you live in the tunnels? So I thought it was incredibly insightful for her. And, and again, it's not just her. There's so many people pointing out like, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. You guys told us for months now, these are billionaires living in hotels, hiding in tunnels, using humans as human shields. And now we find and kill the number one guy literally above ground on the second floor of a building by himself. And oh, again, all that stuff I said, all that preamble, that was the justification to bomb every single hospital, every single school, every single everything. Take out the infrastructure, shut down the water, shut down the electricity, you know, bomb everything, bomb residential buildings because supposedly they're in there. And now it turns out that the leader of the H group was just assassinated while he was alone in a building with his right arm severed, wearing fatigues, fighting against the occupation for the liberation of his people until his very last breath. All right, again, I'm playing this more as a bigger picture comment, okay? This is not necessarily about, you know, saying this is about the occupation and blah, blah, blah. Forget all that stuff for a second. Literally, seriously, just scope this up and... Let's think of this as the big picture, because fundamentally, the question I'm asking is, if really everything that we just saw was the exact opposite of everything, and what I mean is everything that we just saw with the killing of Yaya Sinwar is the exact opposite of everything that we've been told for the past month to justify everything else. Something's not adding up here. What else could they possibly have lied to us about? All right, that that fundamentally kind of plays into what I'm saying, what I said earlier, which was, you know, is this entire situation to 2024 what COVID was to 2020? And again, in a nutshell, I'm talking about disruption. I'm talking about 
chaos a little bit. I'm talking about really just pandemonium, you know, pandemonium. I do love the word pandemonium. Pandemonium. All right, here's another good one. This is this is like some random dude. Give this one a listen. Do you know who makes up Hamas and Hezbollah? It is a bunch of refugees who have survived ethnic cleansing and genocide. Meanwhile, Israel is a nuclear power with one of the top five strongest militaries in the world. Again, just to chime in, that's kind of my point. Like, I don't even understand how this has lasted a year. It's not a fair fight. Like, I, it just doesn't make sense how this continues to go on unless they want it to go on. It's kind of like Muhammad Ali and his rope-a-dope. Oh man, nice analogy. Muhammad Ali and his rope-a-dope, I think against George Foreman, where he sort of just let him keep punching. I think, I think I got the right fight. Anyway, he just let him keep punching and he let him like punch himself, not even punch himself out, but yeah, he did let him do that. But my point is, you know, it's like he's keeping him in the fight because he wants the fight to go on. And that's what I feel like is taking place with all of this. Like, it just doesn't make sense. They should be able to, you know, beat Hamas in like five seconds, but they don't want to beat him in five seconds. And I don't think, I don't think multiple players in this situation want it to end it they just don't and and that includes these arab countries like qatar and saudi arabia and these guys they're part of this too they don't mind this ongoing situation because again i just i can't see how this fight even lasts as long as it did or has they are a larger barrier to peace than anything anyone in Hamas or Hezbollah has ever said, which is why we focus on Israel. All right, really quick. I'm going to play the rest of what he says, but the rest kind of talk about a different thing. You know, I, I do have a lot of my friends are like, well, why do you think why do you think people support Hamas and Hezbollah if they are terrorists? And again, I mean, I'd say, well, hey, I mean. You do need to understand really the context of the last 75 years, but even if you don't understand the context of the last 75 years, and even for argument's sake, we'll agree they are terrorists, you know, fundamentally all these random people, like this is like some random white guy in Kansas city who has no skin in the game. And so the question is, why would a guy like this, you know, support these guys? And here's his answer. We are not trying to elevate anyone in Hamas and Hezbollah to being perfect angels. We are just understanding that there are specific people who have way, way more power of this situation who are not in Hamas or Hezbollah. And that is all we are asking you to do as well. We are asking you to address those with the most power. It got cut off, and man, there was another part that I think I forgot to download. But basically, he was saying, we're asking you to address those with the most power. And then secondly, all we care about is the killing of innocent women and children. And again, that that when, when I meet people or see people that you're like, oh, that's interesting that they are on that side. It's not about anything besides they just don't like innocent women and children dying, you know? They don't like seeing maimed kids. I don't like seeing maimed kids. I don't like seeing kids with their limbs blown off. I don't like seeing someone like burning to death. These are all the visuals that, again, I know most of you might not even be paying attention to this stuff, but man, if you're paying attention to this on Instagram, it's brutal. And again, I'm talking about the innocent civilians, the innocent women and children, especially the children, man. That is absolutely brutal. Absolutely brutal. All right. Total change of topic. Let's move on to election credibility and this whole, uh, I think we're going to start to see a lot more talk around the integrity of these, you know, uh, voting machines and, and electronic voting and things like that. And basically calling for more in-person ballots versus obviously there was a tremendous amount of conflict with mail-in voting mail-in voting for 2020 there was a lot of conflict to be honest 2016 and 2020 well really 2016 there was a lot of controversy around 
the credibility of these voting machines. So again, we all have such short-term memories. We forget all this. So let me play this clip from, ironically, Kamala Harris in 2018. Now listen to this. This is Kamala Harris in 2018. So two years into the Trump presidency and two years before she was one of the nominees for president. Look at where we are now in this year of our Lord 2018. We're talking about paper ballots, but that actually might be one of the smartest systems. Going back to, you know, a day when we could we could have something tangible that we can hold on to because Russia cannot hack a piece of paper like they can a computer system connected to the Internet. So again, that was from 2018. And actually, everything she says makes tremendous amount of sense. It absolutely makes sense. You know, a piece of paper cannot be hacked versus a computer system connected to the internet. Now, that can be hacked, but it can also be controlled. So like, it could be hacked, ready for it, internally or externally. So think about that. I thought that was an interesting clip from 2018. Elon Musk over the weekend, basically made a bunch of statements really talking about how the Dominion machines and voting machines in general, how they could be hacked and how how they could use AI and software to basically make changes. So I think he's going to get sued by Dominion the way they sued Fox and all those other people. So Anyway, I just thought that 2018 clip from from her was interesting. All right, next clip and topic change, and I'm playing this one because it's going viral. It's like got a second life on the internet, and it's it's a comment that Rachel Maddow made, and then what happened after, and it's regarding the Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine. M- remember the J&J one? That was like the one-shot one. I don't know if any of you guys got that one. All around the subject. That gets straight. I got my shot. I did. I'm so excited. I got the Johnson & Johnson uh, one-shot vaccine. Can I just tell you about it for a second? The FDA has temporarily halted the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. For the FDA to pause it because of potential health concerns. I got the Johnson & Johnson uh, one-shot vaccine. Can I just tell you about it for a second? Something called a cerebral venous thrombosis. That's a blood clot in the veins of the brain. Six women who got the vaccine and then ended up getting this blood clot. The six cases a day. Can I just tell you about it for a second? All right. That's one of those clips that unfortunately it's better as a video, but basically it was Rachel Maddow, you know, kind of, you know, just doing what they did. Can I tell you about it for a second? I got it. Blah, blah, blah. And then you never hear them come out after and be like, oh, hey, you know, I did want to issue an apology for promoting that because after she did... That was Trevor Noah and a bunch of other people reporting on how the FDA basically took it off the market because people were experiencing blood clots. So anyway, again, I just play this stuff for you guys because there's so much news and information that goes on and there's so many narratives that, you know, get pumped up, you know, go in another direction. They're just buried. They don't, they don't bring them up anymore. You know what I mean? And, and again, that happens across the board, by the way, that absolutely happens across the board. All right. Anyway, last clip, instead of taking you out on some music today, I'll take you out on a little meme joke, which is pretty funny, but this was like a little cartoon meme of a Gen Z working at nine 11. So it says Gen Z working at nine 11 be like, thank you for calling nine one one. What can I help you with? Sorry, you need to, like, slow down. I can barely understand you. You're going, like, a mile a minute. Your girlfriend shot you? What would you do? <laughs> what would you do? No, I'm sure she had good reason she there. Give her the phone. Give her the phone. Oh, my God. Slay my mom. Yes, period. Queen. I'm getting girl boss energy, and I'm living for it. Yes. Uh, where'd you shoot him? I'm gagged. Oh, my God. Good for you. Stick to the patriarchy, right? What's your sign? Leah, I'm putting that down. Yeah, massage. Match me in heaven, right? Are police on their way? No, babe. We're not giving undeserving men any attention in 2021, and that includes medical. And that includes medical, for real. Is he dead yet? I have a lunch break in, like, two minutes. Oh, thank God. Yeah, no, I could probably Caesar wrap. I'm on, like, a health kick. You know what I mean? 
And hey, well, babe, I have to go. But if you ever want to talk, like, you know where to find me. No, I'm obsessed with you. Like, I love you. Like, I love you. Please. 911, you know the number. It's pretty easy. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye. Oh, my God. That was hilarious. All right. Call Spade Spade. That was a great way to end it. This episode was brought to you by the new book, Deep Shallow Dive Into You. Available now on Amazon and Barnes & Noble in hardcover and paperback. Don't forget to sign up for our new mailing list on our website at deepshallowdive.com.